Breaking news. After the Ukrainian war, the West must communicate with Russia. After the war, NATO allies and Ukraine will need to settle on a plan for re engaging with Russia. A senior member of parliament and political party official from a NATO country recently responded, None at all. When asked what possible plans his country had or would support for its relationship with Russia once the conflict between it and Ukraine ends. While Putin is in power, at least. That would be a huge blunder due to Russia's internal characteristics and its international relationships, particularly, but not exclusively, with China. After the war, NATO allies and Ukraine will need to settle on a plan for re engaging with Russia. Ukraine and its NATO allies' policies toward Russia are being driven by their palpable anger at the Kremlin. Since the Wehrmacht's attack on Poland and the Soviet Union, we have not witnessed such a purposeful, deliberate, indiscriminate, barbaric assault, which reduced entire regions and towns as well as hospitals, schools, nurseries, homes, and power plants to rubble and concrete graveyards. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has laid out a clear goal, saying, we will only stop when we bring our country back to the borders of 1991. We're going to get Ukrainian flags back up all over the country. The Ukrainian military will likely never be able to achieve that admirable goal. Vladimir Putin's plan to end Ukraine's independence, decapitate its government, reoccupy all or nearly all of the country, and incorporate it into a greater Russia is also highly unlikely to succeed. It's highly improbable that the Donbass can be retaken in its entirety at this time. It lacks the personnel, equipment, ammunition, command, strategy, and flair of a modern military short of using its tactical nuclear arsenal. However, neither side is prepared to accept a ceasefire that leaves their troops entrenched in trenches along the length of the Donbass indefinitely, as happened during World War I. As Zelensky has pointed out, the year 2023 is crucial to the success of Ukraine's mission. The tide must turn and Ukrainian forces must make significant advances, expelling Russian forces from the east and the south, within a year. If they don't, Russia will likely gain the upper hand, and the war will likely stall out. The devastation that has been visited upon the Ukrainian people cannot last forever. Neither their own resources nor the political, economic, or military backing of allied countries can keep them going forever, no matter how heroic their resistance may be. That doesn't mean Russia will win, but it does mean that Russia will likely retain control over the majority of the Donbass and all of Crimea and that the legal borders will have to change to reflect that. Allies of Ukraine should collaborate with Kyiv to create and back a practical strategy through 2023, ideally leading to a victory that is both desirable and attainable by Ukrainians. However, international isolation is not a prudent prescription for relations, especially for a country as large and important as Russia once the wanton carnage has ended or subsided despite NATO's outrage at Russian aggression and atrocities. True statecraft necessitates wisdom in both short- and long-term policymaking. Russia will survive, even if Putin doesn't. If NATO countries' policies toward Russia are characterized by anger and hostility, a line of enmity would stretch from the Barents Sea to the Black Sea and, depending on the disposition of Turkey, possibly to the Mediterranean, effectively recreating the Cold War 450 miles to the east. Antagonism between two nuclear armed civilizations would create a border between them, with both sides able to reduce the other to a pulverized, and now radioactive, wreckage with their respective nuclear arsenals. The peace that followed the end of the Cold War 30 years ago, rocky and temporary as it was, would be shattered. That can't be your only, best, or even a good choice. Russia as a federation of republics, the largest country in the world spanning 11 time zones, and a kind of empire in its own right, and policymakers should not let their justified anger toward it blind them to this reality. As a great power in Eurasia, it also has a rich history and an imperial chronicle that dates back three centuries. It still controls a sizable military, albeit one that has seen significant cuts in recent years, and its nuclear arsenal and delivery systems are powerful enough to destroy any potential foe, even if Russia were to suffer catastrophic losses. Even if Russia were to be cut off from the West, it would still be connected to the rest of the world. 
Isolating Russia from the West would be extremely costly for both Russia and the countries that try to do so. Finally, the United States has no interest in driving Russia into China's arms, where it would face a combined challenge from the two superpowers. It would be foolish, arrogant, and potentially counterproductive to treat Russia like it is a desert island in the Pacific, inducing Putin, or his successor, with his depleted forces and economy to negotiate a tolerable resolution and providing clear benefits for doing so is by far the superior strategy. The benefits would include a restoration of trade relations, the lifting of sanctions, and recognition as a world power instead of the denigration it experienced in the 1990s due to the end of the Cold War. Russia, with or without Putin, should be integrated as much as possible into the European family, rather than having no relationship at all and not as a suppliant seeking the forbearance of its superiors. The current support for Ukraine and the response to Russia's barbaric aggression do not necessitate restraint. All that is needed is for the process to include both carrots and sticks, and for NATO members to remember that the end goal isn't a worse status quo, but rather an improved one.